Claro. Okay, hello to everyone. I'm very happy to see you all. Today, uh, we're going to have an excellent talk by Alessandro, um, who is going uh, to be who is going to be telling us um, about, let me look for the title because I don't have it on screen. Um, he's going to be telling us about ADS3 CFT2 integrability. So Alessandro, take it away. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the in kind invitation. I would have very much like to have the opportunity to visit, but uh, the times are what they are. So it's very, very nice that at least uh, uh, I can tell you something remotely. So to make the thing as close as possible to an actual talk, uh, I will try to write on this piece of paper here. And uh, that means that essentially you should really be uh, asking questions because I do have you know, a list of things that I want to tell you about, but I'm perfectly happy to slow down or maybe go more into detail of something if you are more interested. And especially if something that I say uh, is unclear, just ask me. So that's the whole point of the talk. Um, yeah, so that's the most important thing I would say. The other thing is, uh, let's just keep you informal, just ask, just interrupt me. And then without further ado, I want to tell you something about ADS3 CFT2. And in fact, probably I should have written integrability because this is sort of the main uh, topic that I will be talking about or the main set of techniques that I will be using. Let's try one. Ah, okay. Um, so let me just start and give you a little bit of the feeling of what we want to do and why this integrability comes into play. So the idea here is that we are interested in computing a certain class of observables and we want to compute them as exactly as possible. And for the purpose of this talk, we want to compute typically ADS CFT inspired observables. There are several observables that you can consider on the CFT side, for instance. You have correlation functions of local operators. This would be a two-point function. I guess this would be O and O dagger, to have a non-trivial two-point function. And then you could have a three-point function. Etc. right? And in string theory, typically we think that this is coming from a genus expansion where first we start from a, from a string side, from the sphere topology for this with two insertions. And then there will be maybe a correction where we have one loop, et cetera, et cetera. And similar thing for the three-point function. And ideally, we would like to compute all of these objects. Now, for the purpose of this talk, I will be talking about the simplest by far of all these observable, which is this one. Is the planar two-point function. Just to remind you, the planar two-point function in the CFT boils down to computing a single number. Strictly speaking, it is the planar two-point function of scalar primary operators, but regardless, it's something always of this form, and it boils down to compute this number, which might depend on the parameters of this of the theory, for instance, g square, actually let, let me call it lambda, it's maybe more traditional, is the various parameters that you have. I call it lambda because that would be the Toft, uh, the Toft coupling. And on the string side, delta of lambda is the energy of the string state. 
So just to remind you, in string theory. Uh, Alessandro, can you move it a bit because we cannot see the upper part? Yes. Yeah, do remind me when I, I will be making the mistake, this mistake uh, several times. One of the first things you compute in string theory is the spectrum. For instance, in flat space, that's some exercise that we tend to do in the first uh, string theory course. And the spectrum, which maybe we call E, of the various ni that make up a string state is something that has a relatively simple form. Maybe it looks something like this. So it depends on some numbers n and then tilde, where n is the sum of the oscillators of one type, chiral oscillators, let's say, and then tilde is the sum of the antichiral oscillators and the given string state. If I act with this E operator on a string state, the string state looks something like this. Alpha minus N1, alpha minus N up to some number, alpha tilde minus N tilde one, alpha tilde minus N tilde tilde acting on some vacuum right and this thing gives e on the same state so this is something that uh, hopefully is familiar and the thing that i wanted to emphasize is that here there is maybe some number that depends on how we fix the gauge and there is a parameter which is basically the tension in some appropriate uh, units or is related to the tension in some appropriate unit and then you have this very simple spectrum Okay, simple because we can write it in close form. Another example is ADS5 process 5, which is related to n equal 4 superior means. Well, it's dual to n equal 4 superior means. And there, the spectrum is much more complicated. So, for instance, There is a state called the Konishi state there. Is a state in a, well, it's an operator in an equal force of and therefore this is a state in the string theory. And for that thing, delta is equal to, I'm not going to write it, but I'm going to show it to you. It is from a paper by Marbo and Volin. And you can sort of see that delta, well, it's not a closed function. It depends on g square. G square here is what I call lambda morally. And you see that it starts innocent enough. 4 plus 12 g square minus 48 g to the fourth. And then before you know it, you start having zetas and multiple zeta functions and so on and so forth, right? And uh, essentially, nobody would know how to write this function for a finite value of g in closed form, OK? This is just to flesh out a little bit the type of spectrum that we have in ADS5 process 5. This is one state, but it's basically representative of any state in any in any equal force of miss or in ADS5 process 5. If you compute a state that is not protected, it will look, roughly speaking, as complicated as this. So, in other words, we have seen that ADS5. Uh, ca can you zoom out, Alessandro? Yeah, very good. Thank you very much. ADS5 crosses five as a spectrum, which I will call complicated. And another property that the spectrum has is that it's, it's non degenerate. Meaning that if you take two states that are in different multiplets, they will have different anomalous dimensions in general. Maybe in the free and mill theory, they will have the same dimension, but if they are in the same multiplets, they will have different dimensions. In flat space, 
It was the example that I did before. It's simple, meaning that it can be written in closed form and it's very degenerate. So very degenerate means that if I go back a second to what I wrote, this expression here, dependent on the sum of an i and the sum of n tilde i, subject to the level matching condition, but it didn't depend on the individual n i. So there are a bunch of states that have the same curly n, meaning that then they have the same energy. And this is a huge, if you think about it, it's a huge degenerates, right? If you have, it grows combinatorically, if you have with the number of oscillators that you have. Alessandro can ask a question here. Yes. So this seems a bit like the dichotomy usually between, I don't know, integrable and chaotic systems. But I suppose you will argue that even for this 5 versus 5, you can use integrability to understand the spectrum model. Yeah, so the point is that this spectrum of ADS5 versus 5 is integrable. It can be computed exactly. It cannot be written in closed form, but it is something that we know exactly. It's still much more complicated than this. So uh, the point is, what are the techniques that allow us to sort of understand this sort of setup and see that maybe, you know, in special cases, it introduces to this much simpler setup. So I'm a bit running ahead of myself, but uh, one of the reasons why ADS3 CFT2 is interesting is that ADS3 crosses three cross T4, which is the simplest example of ADS3 CFT2, interpolates between this guy, which I will call one, and this guy, which I will call two. So there is a setup which is called pure Ramon Ramon. The ground. So H, which is dB, is equal to zero for this the ground. This looks like ADS five crosses five, and basically nothing is known. about this background. I mean that in principle is known, you know, the matrix and so on, the fluxes are known, but at the quantum level, very little is known. The quantum spectrum is not known. The three-point function of operators that are not protected is not, are, are not known. The dual theory of this is absolutely not known. And this is a background, which by the way, is physically very interesting because it's related to the D1, D5 system. It's what emerges from the near horizon limit of the D1, D5 system. Then there is another background, which is the pure NSNS background, where basically the string nonlinear sequence model is given by Vesuminovite model. And this is uh, related to NS5 and fundamental strings. And this is similar to flat space. So it has a simple and degenerate. spectrum. On top of that, it has both long and short strings and because it is so simple, because it's given by the Zuminovitian model, which is a relatively simple theory, the dual is sort of 
understood. Whether the dual is really understood, it depends on who you ask. There is a proposal. If I call K the level of the Vesuminovite model, which is the number of NS5 brains, K equal to one is sort of well understood, and K equals to two, three, and so on is maybe understood. So you see how this seemingly sort of innocuous model, which is very similar to flat space streams, as simple as it can get, is still full of surprises. And in particular, something else that I should say, it is possible but harder to consider mixed fluxed backgrounds, which means that you start from a D1, D5, NS5, and fundamental string system, and you take the neural eyes on the of that. Of this, very little is known. So we have this setup, which should be very simple. And even when it's very simple, we understand it sort of. And then we have the possibility of deforming it. Essentially, you start from the Vesuvian Witten model, you turn on some deformation parameter. And then basically, we stop to understand everything. This huge degeneracy of states that we have disappears, the long strings disappear from the spectrum. We are only left with short strings when we have mixed flux and we cannot do any calculation. So the point of using integrability here is to try to solve this problem. And the good news, which allows us to do whatever we want to do, as a classical, 2D quantum field theory, oh, sorry, a classical 2D field theory, which is classical, it's not a quantum field theory. The string nonlinear sigma model is integrable. And for the moment, I'm not going to tell you what it means. I'm just going to tell you that there is some hope based on classical properties of this theory that the integrability approach that can work, we know works for other theories, can also be used here. So this is sort of the picture that I wanted to give you. We have this huge parameter space that on the one end is very simple, on the other end is as complicated as solving an equal four superior mills. And very little is known. And even what is known is basically just in these simpler cases where the theory has very, very special positions in the model space. So what I want to do now is to try to tell you how we can solve this theory. So are there any questions at this point before I get more into the sort of meat of the talk? Okay, then I will move on. and tell you two words about classical integrability. So classical integrability, what does it mean? Well, uh, you probably know one example, which is the Liouville theorem in Hamiltonian mechanics. The Liouville theorem tells you that if you have a system with n degrees of freedom and you have n quantities that are all commuting or some commuting among each other then you can find action angle variables so the motion of your system which look complicated is just some simple motion with some torque basically the equation of motion become linear in action in action angle variables 
Now, the Liouville theorem, as I stated it, doesn't really work for field theories because field theories have infinitely many degrees of freedom. So saying that you need to find sufficiently many conserved quantities, as many as the degrees of freedom, is not very nice if you have infinite sets. So classical integrability as another uh, toolbox in field theory. And the statement is, if the equation of motion can be written in a special form, which sometimes is called the Lux form because Peter Lux came up with this, then two things happen. There are infinitely many conserved charges. which can be constructed explicitly. And the equations of motion can be solved as if they were linear, so to say. Of course, they are not linear, but there is some way of changing variables and so on, okay? Now, if you know that this is classical integrability, what about quantum integrability? So for quantum integrability, the first thing would be, well, I have, a, let's say, a classical Hamiltonian, and I try to quantize it in some way so that I preserve the fact that the Hamiltonian commutes with these infinitely many charges. Now, this is extremely hard. Even if I give you a very simple uh, system, like, you know, a spinning top, stuff like that, it's very, very hard. A smart approach, which dates back to the 70s and is due, among other people, to zomological and zomological, is to study the S matrix instead of the Hamiltonian. Now, in our case, remember, we, we are talking about the two dimensional field theory which defines the string nonlinear sigma model. So in our case, this S matrix is the S matrix on the worship. As opposed to the string S matrix. There is no string S matrix for us because I told you that I'm doing planar string theory, the strings are free. So G string is equal to zero for us. Okay. So the problem of studying the string as matrix is, uh, well, there are two problems, at least, in studying the string as matrix on the worship. So worship, rather than string, I should call it as matrix. scatters the modes of the string. So morally, it scatters the, what I call before alpha minus n. These are the things that create a, a particle on, this, on the worship of the string. So one problem is that one is that we have longitudinal 
modes in the string which are not physical. That's the first thing that can be problematic. The second thing is that uh, eventually we are interested in a target space quantity, not a worksheet count quantity. So what do I mean? What I mean is that what we want to compute, we said it before, is delta. And delta is a conserved charge, which classically is related by the to the integral on the worksheet of some conserved momentum. Is the generator of T translation in ADS, where T is ADS time. H, the worship Hamiltonian, by comparison, is basically something like this. It's related to the generator of tau translation. on the worship. So we want to compute this, but integrability is uh, defined on the worship. So the way to resolve this problem and also this other problem of the S matrix uh, is actually a sort of killing two birds with one stone, which is use light con gauge. So light con gauge only scatters the physical degrees of freedom. You completely gauge fixed away the longitudinal ones, so that's fine. And it's also fine for this because you see in light con gauge, you say that essentially T in ADS may be combined with some other coordinate on the sphere. Alessandro, can you move the, yeah, the page? Sorry. Thank, Thank you. you. So T in ADS combined with some other coordinates on the sphere is time on the worship. That's essentially what light con gauge does for you. So therefore, you create a relation between delta and H worship, which is the worship Hamiltonian. So this is the sort of, this is the first step in this construction. If we work in light con gauge, we have a chance of finding quantities that first of all are physical and then relate back to what we want, which is Delta. Is this all right so far? Okay. Now, why the S matrix? Why? So I told you that the Hamiltonian is sort of hard to work with. I didn't really show you how, but I can tell you maybe instead that the S matrix is very nice to work with. The S matrix as a consequence of the infinitely many charges, conserved charges, of an integrable theory it has nice properties so one property is that if you have two particles with momentum p1 and p2 here they do something complicated you don't really know what they do but what you know for sure is that two particles of momentum P2 and P1 emerge. 
So the scattering is elastic and there is no particle production. By the way, in this picture, my worship time tau flows upwards and my worship space is on the horizontal. The other nice thing is that this holds even more generally. If you have P1, P2 and P3. Essentially, all that happens is that you rearrange the order of the particles. Before, the fastest particle was this one. Then as time evolved, this particle catches up with this one and with this one, and you get the particles in reverse order. Even more is true, in fact, you can show that not only you have this picture, but you can break it down into a sequence of two particle events. Each of the events is complicated by itself, but you can arrange the particles so that these guys are well separated. And it means that if you understand the two particle as matrix, you have understood the three particle and in fact, any as matrix. Now, this is not the end of the story actually, because it turns out that there is another picture that I could have drawn. And you see that as time flows up, here first, I scatter two and three, is the first scattering event that I have. And here I first scattering one and two instead. So the order in which the scattering takes place in these two pictures is not the same. So the equality is, if you want a consistency requirement of this picture of factorization, or you could even prove that it's a consequence against of the existence of the conserved charges. And this equation has a name, which is famous, is called the Jan Baxter equation. So I have a question, Alessandro. So should one sum over all the different possibilities or is the statement that either possibility is equal to the final result? Either possibility is equal to the final result. Uh -huh. It will sum. This is a cubic equation for the S matrix. By the way, uh, the S matrix normally is an, inf is an operator really, it's an infinite dimensional thing. But here the two to two S matrix, since it's only two to two, is actually just a finite matrix. So in string theory, or I should say super string theory, we have eight bosons plus eight fermions, which makes 16 particles. So the S matrix is a 16 square by 16 square matrix, the two to two S matrix, right? So it's just some big block of matrix. And if you take the product of these guys with different momenta in different orders, you have to get an identity. That's what the Jan Baxter equation is telling. Now, uh, we did something actually quite remarkable with this reasoning or other terminologic of it. We boiled down the problem of solving an entire theory to the problem of, comp uh, of computing a big matrix, which you know, is big, but it's a matrix, we can do it. So there is even more uh, to say, because not only the two to two S matrix is all that we need, but also the 2 to 2 S matrix can be computed just essentially based on symmetry considerations. So if there are no questions, I'm going to tell you how you, which sort of symmetry consideration give you the S matrix. And now I will start saying things that are more, more particular to AGS3 cross S3 cross T4. Any questions? So how you compute the S matrix for AGS3 cross S3 cross T4? Well, you take ADS3 cross S3 cross T4. The first thing that you do is that you study the symmetries. The symmetries are PSU1, 1 slash 2 plus PSU1, 1 slash 2 plus stuff that has to do with the torus, which we don't really care about. It's not important. I put it in bracket. 
So PSU 1 comma 1 slash 2 is a super algebra. And what it means is that it contains here a piece which is SU 1 comma 1, which is also known as SO 2 comma 1 or SL 2R. All these algebras, they are sort of the same. And this guy is the same, it's another SU 1 comma 1, of course. And this describes the, the isometries of ADS3 because ADS3 is actually, as isometry, is SO2,2, and SO2,2 is SO1,2 square, or 2,1, sorry. I'm getting my signatures a bit mixed up. And then there is a, this part which is simpler, which is the R symmetry of the algebra, and this is SO, SO2, and this is SO2. And I think you got what is going to happen here. This is SO4, which is SO2 square. And then there are some U1s from the torus, but the U1s, as always, are much less interesting. Then on top of these bosonic things, you also have plus eight, or rather I should say plus four Qs and four Ss here and other four Qs and four Ss, where the Qs are the supersymmetry generators and the Ss are the super conformal generators. Of course, geometrically, these are all killing spinners. So this background has 16 real supersymmetries, which is half of the maximal amount. And they are packaged in this, this two, in this two, into these two algebras. And the fact that you have this split between these guys, which I could call left, and this guy, which I could call right, and I indicate with a tilde sometimes. So these guys, I could put a tilde. Is related to the fact that there is a split also in the dual conformal field theory, where the symmetry becomes n equal 4, comma 4, supersymmetry in d equal 2. So this is the symmetry of the theory. But we don't want the symmetries of the theory. We want the symmetries of the theory in light con gauge because I insisted that the S matrix needs to be computed in light con gauge. So in light con gauge, we had introduced T plus phi, which was tau. And correspondingly, the worship Hamiltonian, if you relate this, these quantities, you also relate the conjugate momenta, is related to delta minus j, where this guy is some u1 on S3. We can even be a little bit more precise and say that in this SU1, comma 1, or this SL2R, we have generators L0 and L plus minus 1. Here, of course, we have L0 tilde and L plus minus 1 tilde. And in the SU2, we have, as usual, J3 and J plus minus. And here we have j tilde 3 and j tilde plus minus. So in terms of these generators, which is the usual generators of, ADS, of SL2R and of SU2, here we get from this part, which is the ADS part, we get L0 plus L0 tilde. And for the sphere part, we get J3 and J3 field. okay? So the symmetries that we want to find are symmetries that commute with the worship Hamiltonian. That's what it means to be a symmetry after you fix the gauge. And you see that because you have L0, J plus, sorry, uh, L plus and L minus cannot be there because they don't commute with L0. And uh, similarly, J plus and J minus cannot be there. So of the bosonic part of the algebra, you are just left with the cartons. And of the supersymmetries, 
you break actually half of them. To see that, that requires a little bit more work that I have time for, but maybe you can believe me. So you keep the cartan elements. So the ones essentially plus one half of the supersymmetry, which means that we have eight in total. This ugly number is an eight. And I'm going to tell you the algebra that you get. Because it's very simple. So we have two Qs where A can be one or two. I'm going to write it maybe here in the corner. And two S's. And the Q with an S gives, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to call it E, which is just L0 minus J3. And it so happens that since the Q and the S's are actually conjugate to each other, this number is greater or equal than zero. And in fact, the fact that this number is greater or equal than zero is the PPS bound of PSU 1, 1 slash 2. And then you have a completely similar relation for these guys. So remember H worship, which is also equal to delta minus J, you can see it from here is E plus E tilde and is also greater or equal than zero. And is zero only for the BPS states. That's something that one can prove. So there are some BPS states in this theory, and this Hamiltonian is exactly zero on the BPS states, and otherwise is not zero. However, one interesting thing happens when you compute the representation of this algebra on the fields semi-classically. You find that there is another co commutator that is not zero, which is this one. And I'm going to write it and then I will comment. So there is a central extension of this algebra, which couples left and right. So what does it mean? It means that this integrable theory is a bit more complicated than you would have that you would have anticipated just by studying the isometries. Essentially, wh when you fix the gauge, you make the symmetries a little bit more complicated, and you have something that couples left and right. So, if I have an excitation, for instance, let me say that I create a particle of momentum p on my vacuum. I call this state just p, okay, and I ask, what is p? Oh, sorry, what is the, the operator C when it acts on a state with P1 through Pn excitations? It's something that we can compute semi-classically. And it has a very nice form, if you think about it. So it's proportional. Well, there is an I, that's not important. But it's proportional to this expression so that this is zero if the sum of the PIs is zero, which is a level matching condition. And it's also proportional to the constant H, which is a constant that characterizes the theory and is the amount of our flux. So 
Another thing that we can find by doing this calculation is that whether we are in the NSNS, which was the simple theory on the, on the or in the Ramon Ramon theory, which was the more complicated one, appears in the presence of this central extension C. Another thing that we can find out is that E minus E tilde instead, the other combination than one that is not the total energy, is equal to L0 minus L0 tilde minus J3 minus J3 tilde. And that is the spin, essentially. This is some spin in ADS. And this is the spin in S3. So this is something else that can be computed can be computed uh, uh, in a semi-classical way. So we have the algebra. All that we need to, uh, to go on is to find the representations, or in other terms, the states like P, or maybe a two-particle state, P1, P2, or an n-particle state transform in representation of the algebra above. These representation, you can study them, you can characterize them. I don't want to go to that much into detail, but they satisfy certain very stringent conditions, conditions including a shortening condition. And studying them is enough to fix. Out of the shortening condition, you can fix H of P, which is basically what Well, let me write it like this. If you add with the Warshit Hamiltonian on a state, you get H of P. That's basically the dispersion relation of a particle. And H of P can be expressed in an explicit way in terms of parameters that characterize the theory. So I'm going to write it first and then I will comment more. So that's one thing that is possible to find. And then it's also possible to find S of P1, P2, which you find by requiring that if you have Q of P1, P2, and S of P1, P2 appropriately defined, they commute. Just asking that the S matrix commutes with the symmetries that we described in the representation that you have to construct is enough to fix the S matrix. And that's basically almost all that you need to find the theory. Now, without going into detail of the S matrix, I want to go into some detail of this formula. This tells you the energy of a single excitation on your worship is something that, for instance, for a massive theory would be, for a regular relativistic theory, it would be square root of M squared plus P squared. So here you see that it's very funny. And there is this part, which we said is the Ramon Ramon flux, is h square. And this guy here, that is the NSNS flux or WZW level. So essentially, you see from this dispersion relation, but is then something that uh, carries over in the discussion of the S matrix, the spectrum, and everything that you have two very particular cases. So if you have an SNS only, H of P is just the modulus of M plus K over two pi P, 
And if you have Ramon among only, you have that h of p is the square root of m square plus 4a square sine square of p over p. So this is a relative, well, it's almost a relativistic dispersion. I mean, it's like a relativistic field in a the ground gauge field, but it's a massless relativistic model. And this thing instead looks like a lattice model. And then you have something in between that interpolates. So this is more or less all that I wanted to say to tell you that how we can get a feeling for this. And then there is a whole machinery that I don't want to describe for reasons of time uh, that allows you, once you have fixed this S matrix, once you have fixed this dispersion, to extract the eigenvalues of H on a state that is physical, that satisfies the level matching condition, and so on and so forth. And then from the H, since H is delta minus J, you can go back and extract the, the string spectrum, which is what we wanted. Now, the thing that I wanted to stress here is uh, uh, that this procedure is something that on the worksheet is chiral in some sense, because here you see particles move at the speed of light, k over two pi is the speed of light in this theory, either to the left or to the right. And it's kind of in the, in the point where this theory has a nice, uh, it has a nice uh, uh, worship CFT description where it is a Bessemer Witten model. And then it becomes something much more complicated as you tune in, tune on this uh, other parameter, the Ramon Ramon flux. So, having said this, let me just. So this is all the data that I wanted to give. I want to conclude and just give you an overview of what has been done and what remains to be done. So the NSNS theory is understood, or the spectrum, I should say, the planar spectrum is understood as a WZW model. So we can compute numbers essentially very easily as WZW model. And this is known since 20 years already, as well as by integrability. The Ramon Ramon theory. is understood by integrability only. And I have very uh, strong doubts that any CFT approach will really allow you to compute this. There is something on the market, which is this Verkowitz Vapa bit and hybrid approach. But uh, while in principle, you can use it in practice, it seems extremely hard to use it. And it's not so surprising that it is hard, it's just that the problem is inherently much harder. And then you have the mixed theory, the mixed flux theory, uh, still to be understood, I would say. So in principle, it should be possible to understand it by integrability, but it's not being done. And then you have, 3.4 point, point functions they are broadly speaking fine at the nsns point so in the pure nsns theory uh, i should say by cft techniques or by wzw techniques and they should be possible to study in principle by integrability but it is very much work in progress so this i think what i wanted to tell you for uh, 
So to give you a feeling of why the problem is more complicated, uh, what can be done to, to, to study it and how far we got. Of course, this sort of computation, like computing the, uh, the spectrum of non-protected operators is one of the basic ingredients that you need to sort of put in the game in order to have some hope of understanding the dual CFT. Now, uh, given how complicated the spectrum is, it's likely that this, du this dual CFT is also a highly non-trivial object. But what exactly it is, uh, is still to be understood. So I think I, I will stop here and uh, maybe you can ask me if you have more questions or something that's not clear. Great, let's thank uh, Alessandro for a great talk. And uh, yes, if you have any questions, now is the time to, to ask them. Okay, can I ask a question? So it's a bit, okay, it goes a bit beyond the discussion that you offered here, but uh, there was this paper. So Lawrence Eberhardt uh, was, trying to understand essentially the solution of the factorization problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was working essentially with this theory, but in the special k equals one point of yes. the NSNS theory, right? This uh, symmetric uh, product or default point. Yes. And there he managed to solve, let's say, this problem very explicitly. Okay, the model is free, very simple. So mm -hmm. I was wondering whether, you know, because now you, you have all these tools so that you can go beyond that k equals one point where the solution was rather trivial, whether you could essentially extend the discussion and understand, let's say, these uh, recent yeah, problems that so have been arisen, let's say, using these techniques from, from the world sheet. So, um, yes and no, uh, meaning that um, in principle, this technique that I described, that I sketched here, uh, and a more refined technique, which has to do with basically triangulating the world sheet. So if you have, I don't know, your four point functions, you triangulate it in some way. And you lower the page, Alessandro? Oh yeah, sorry. Thanks. So you, tri you triangulate your, in this case, sphere. Um, let's say like this. Uh, yeah, I think that this is a, this is a triangle. Right, there are four triangles, one, two, three, four, I guess. So if you, if you do this, you can decompose a four-point function, a three-point function, an n-point function, even a higher genus correlator, which I'm not going to draw because then the tessellation becomes extremely complicated. But you can decompose these in blocks, each of which is integrable in a certain sense. So this guy here, each of these is integrable meaning that you have a hope of studying this exactly. The problem is that the complexity of, of this tessellation goes, grows very much as you go to higher and higher genus. And uh, to my mind, this is uh, a bit unavoidable in the sense that if you're not in a free theory, if you're not at this very special point, you cannot expect such a simple answer, I'm afraid. I guess that the other place where you could think of doing something similar is maybe the NSNS point, okay? Um, at which point I would maybe just uh, do it for strings in flat space because I didn't really say that, but strings in flat space, they're very similar to the NSNS theory. They're also integrable and they're, they're even simpler essentially. I will just uh, show a little bit this thing. Here you have this parameter M that can take several values. In flat space, you have exactly the same thing, but you don't have this end here. It's just modulus of P essentially, expression addition. So it's an even simpler theory. And uh, um, yeah, that's maybe the place where, where I would try to do it if I had to try it anywhere. It's clear to me that when you deform the symmetric product orbifold away from the orbifold point, uh, the complication uh, uh, of the calculation grows enormously. So, so you believe that even for the NSNS point for k different than one? So may, maybe, maybe that maybe. you can do it. Okay. 
so uh, yeah certainly i wouldn't i wouldn't i wouldn't dream of doing the sure, sure. The, the one with ramon ramon the one with ramon ramon is like asking to solve uh, young meals yeah. at arbitrations yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. exactly no no uh, that, just a okay. dnsns point okay. but uh, yeah if anything the the vesuminovitan points might might be doable um but uh, yeah one would need to and this is one thing that in fact with Lawrence I was discussing to basically adapt these integrability techniques of tessellation to the case to the special case of uh, the NSNS backgrounds any other questions maybe a bit of like a naive question on my part but it's like how far how far are we like in this technique to be able to do to be able to like do things like compute entanglement entropy um and so check that's, a, mm -hmm. uh, that's an interesting question i saw something that people have considered that much by these techniques uh, entanglement entropy in particular um they have been focusing very much on local operators somehow that's uh, uh that seemed to be possible but there are some things, so there are some non-local observables, typically uh, Wilson loops and things like that, that, uh, uh, that people have been studying. Um, I don't think that entanglement entropy has been studied, if not semi-classically. So one thing that sh I should say is that since the theory is classically integrable, a problem like computing the area with, with minimal surface is a little bit simpler than in other models, right? Just because there is some inherently niceness to the differential equations that you have to solve. So some of this has been done, but uh, nobody has really tried to use the full power of integrability to solve the question of that type. Any other questions? Good. Uh, if we have no more questions, let's thank Alessandro one more time. Thank you very much. <laughs>